Welcome to Tramlines, a podcast from Agri. I'm your host, Tony Smith, putting your questions to the experts. In this episode, we're talking to Philip Mark Consultants and Agri's crop input specialists, John Charlton and Matt Richardson. Today, we are at the World Biogas Expo at the NEC Birmingham, where a summary of results from the Brotherton Eye Farm forage trials and biogas plant were presented by Phil Marr. We'll be looking into those findings, asking where are the opportunities and key benefits, both financial and agronomic, for the farm business. So, good morning to you all. So, Philip, if I can start by asking that first question so that we all have clarity of understanding, what is anaerobic digestion? What are AD plants? Well, regarding the anaerobic digesters, um, we call them ADs for short, uh, really it's the production of methane, hydrogen and also CO2, but the methane is used really either for gas to grid or running engines, CHP engines, that will produce electricity that will go into the grid line, the electric grid line. That is the basic principles of the AD plant. Thanks, Philip. And John, coming to you as a crop input specialist, how often are you seeing these plants uh, crop up on farms? It's it's a developing industry. Um, there is there's a growing need with the gas price, and and obviously commodity markets been as uh, fluid as they are. People are looking at other options, so it provides a better rotation in the arable system. And obviously, there's a fertilizer aspect and crop nutrition aspect comes into it as well. Sure, and Matt, from your point of view, you work in a slightly different part of the world, but still up there in Yorkshire. Uh, how frequently are you seeing these uh, th- these operations on farms? Uh, more and more, uh, as John's quite rightly said, the the level of volatility with the commodity markets, um, farmers being able to grow these these crops for the for the AD plants for the energy markets is becoming more and more frequent. They've got pressures from grass weeds um, and rising costs of growing growing wheat and oilseed rape. So yeah, we're seeing a, a significant rise in the, the amount of farmers with interest and inquiring to see if there's an AD plant in their area which they could maybe source a energy crop for. Yeah, sure. And you can hear the, the buzz here at this Expo event, just how much interest there is. Um, Philip, let's come back to you and talk about some of the work where you've been looking at uh, different materials, cropping materials that you can put into an AD plant uh, and the work at Brotherton. Can you tell us a bit about what that study was all about? Really, the <clears throat> brother and I farm that I've been doing work and trials with now for the past 20 years, the two brothers approached me eight years ago at looking at a um, build of an AD plant to an electric grid system. And the question was, what do we feed these AD plants with regarding the forage crops that we could grow on the farm? And really, it just came back to probably two or even three was maize, hybrid rye and also energy beet. But over the years and evaluation, energy energy beet we discounted because of the logistics of having to wash, clean, chop and then ensile when there was only two members of staff on the farm. So the logistics of growing energy beet for the AD we dismissed. But what we did find with the growing of maize and rye And we've been growing rye in some fields, continuous for eight years, but totally eliminated the biggest problem we had was a resistant ryegrass to chemistry, agrochemicals. We have now cleared that field completely of ryegrass simply by fighting fire with fire, as I say, by using the rye crop, which gets foraged as the ryegrass within that crop, if it gets away, is taken out without seeding back into the soil. So that is two things we've seen, particularly with the spring-drilled maize, again reducing the pressure from grass weeds, but also bringing us a material that will produce good supplies of biomethane. And that's really interesting, Philip, because just as Matt said, you know, that management of grass weeds and other weeds on that farm is a real benefit in being able to grow these spring crops, whereas our, and my initial assumption was that the primary reason for putting an AD plant in was purely to generate um, energy. So we've got that additional benefit on farm straight away, haven't we? How valuable is it being able to control those difficult weeds, John? Um, it's, 
it's fundamental to long-term crop production. Um, agrochemical control is becoming more of a challenge and rotational control is is a lot more effective it's just a step change in in the crops grown on farm to facilitate facilitate this with ideally moving ad cropping into an arable scenario great and and philip coming back to you know helping that ad plant work to its maximum efficiency um how do hybrid rye and maize why do they work so well in plant well, really, when I've looked at the um, inclusion of rye and um, forage maize in the plant itself, it is crucial to getting the ratio right to produce the maximum methane levels that we can achieve. And really, we've done a series of work where we've used a straight rye as the main food constituent <coughs> or straight maize as the food constituent. But then we, we started looking at mixing 50-50, 75-25, and we could see the results of the production of methane increase to the maximum we could achieve by a ratio of 75% maize and 25% rye in that daily ration. And the ration, daily ration at Rotherham will use something in the region of 40 tonne a day. So again, it's trying to get the maximum yield out of the rye crop and the forage rye. And this is really the help of understanding nutrition-wise, fertilizer-wise, seed rate, plant population to achieve that aim. Fascinating. So how can a crop input specialist, we've got two here, John and Matt, how can they influence the quality of that crop that's going into the plant? Really, it's... A, providing us with the correct varieties of work that I've done, particularly with the variety of rye, the big forage yielders, because I have subdivided it with the work I've done at, with the trials at Robin, where we get purely forage rye varieties, like the L tops of this world, and then subdivide that into what I class as dual purpose varieties, which will produce good forage yields, but also good grain yields. And then the other, the last piece of jigsaw, is varieties of rye that are purely for grain yield and aren't they sustainable for good forage yields, which we need in the biomass plant. Is varietal selection so important when it comes to growing a crop for AD? One is basically the amount of fresh forage yield at 32% dry matter. That is critical, particularly if growers are growing for an AD plant. And they're quoted a figure from £35 a tonne of forage. So we want the highest yielding biomass variety. The other one, which is probably more interesting to the plant managers, and I've done work and results through independent laboratories, of this difference in the amount of each variety that's producing methane. And I've found that there's some varieties there that will produce anywhere between 35 cubic metres of methane per tonne of forage than other varieties. So that is important for a plant manager who's got 10,000 or 50,000 tonne of that particular variety because of the amount of extra methane is going to produce from that variety. And is varietal selection just as important with hybrid rye as it is with maize? Yes, most definitely, but probably the difference is maize is really the harvesting because you get the very early varieties and you get the very late varieties. So you could be foraging maize, some varieties in late October, and as we know, three years ago, those fields you could not get winter wheat drilled. They were like tank training grounds with roots and so forth. So it's crucial there on the variety of maize of one, getting the big yields, and two, the earliness of harvest. And, and listening to Philip there, John and Matt, uh, in terms of what he needs for that plant to really, really be successful, how much adjustment on farm do you think a farmer actually needs to do in growing, whether it's the hybrid rye or, or the maize crop? Is there much that they need to do that's different to what they might already be doing? I don't think so. I, th I think it's just a change of mindset. Um, and a, a lot of farmers are used to the, the traditional uh, wheat, 
oilseed rate, winter barley rotation, um, and it's basically fitting rye in as a cereal, um, growing it as they would any other crop. Uh, it's just having a different mindset that you're actually growing a crop for, for whole crop and not, not necessarily for harvest. So yeah, once you get that change in mindset and, and, and just basically factor it into your rotation, the rat really, the, the rest sort of comes as part of growing the crop with the, with the right advice, with the right strategy which we can provide with the farmer. And I think a lot of it comes back to having the iFarm, having Brotherton to be able to use as a base to be able to say, well, we've got an anaerobic digester on that farm. We can basically, anything we want to put into our anaerobic digester offer or our biogas offer, we can then trial at Brotherton to be able to be comfortable to say to a farmer, yeah, we've had it in the trial, we've had it through the plant, it works. You can now incorporate that system onto your farm. Indeed, what a valuable research uh, site that is. I mean, incredibly valuable. Um, so Matt, give us some context. What is the Brotherton trial site? To me, Tony, the, the Brotherton trial site is in near Nottingley, West Yorkshire. And that is basically anything about AD in terms of growing the crop, looking after the crop is all under one roof. Are you equipped with the understanding of which varieties are going to work best to give these AD plants the best chance of, of that production of, of methane? Yes, uh, absolutely. And it, it comes back to what what Philip said about what's going on at Brotherton. Um, the last 10 years we've learned significantly much more about rye uh, than we ever thought we would do um, in terms of the, the, the leaf development, the drilling dates, the, the, the fresh weight uh, tonnages that are coming off each variety. Philip, coming back to you, we're, we're talking about the crop here, but have we jumped too far ahead without thinking about, well, actually I've got to put that plant in or do we contribute to somebody else's AD plant that they've got within the, the, the local area but where do we start? Well I get involved actually with being on the register of AD um, uh, bills and so forth where I can find where uh, planning permission has been granted to an AD uh, on a farm or industrial site and what sort of forage will they be looking at because on certification and planning they've got to put on is it food waste they're going to be using or energy crops or slurries or manures that sort of thing and I've set up several groups that of growers that are growing specifically for that particular AD plant and this is open particularly in Scotland that comes to mind particularly up near Peterhead where a rather big uh, AD plant went up there. And really, it's been a, a big blessing. They've been going six years where they couldn't really grow good crops of oilseed rape because their harvest of spring barley was off in October, which was too late for drilling oilseed rape. What they found by growing a hybrid rye, which is foraged by the end of June, early July, gave them real good operation time of getting their rape in early in August to get the maximum yield. So it's been a big eye opener in that part of Scotland and again using it at very others, uh, AD plants, Dundee and, and moving down to the borders and I'll probably get around about 20 or 30 AD plants um, trying to sort problems out for them which I've got the experience of what we've had at Robin. Of those 20 to 30 plants how many are growing crops like hybrid rye or maize for their own plant and how many are actually sourcing that crop from outside of their own home farm? Um, I would say it'll be a 50-50. So quite a sizable percentage actually so quite an opportunity for farmers that are near those uh, AD plants. Very very interesting indeed. So John and Matt listening to Philip's um, points there about the AD plant. Um, what's the limitations for farmers getting involved? Uh, the available land area and making uh, making efficient cropping and, and a good product mix for the plant in the end and, and that, that's a bit we're involved with. Varietal selection, crop nutrition, advice on harvesting, advice on storage, advice on additives in storage and making best, best practice of that. But the so what, and this is the question, we can, we, can, we can share this around, but the so what is, well, I'm a farmer, I'm listening to this, how can I actually get involved? It sounds like it could really work for my farm. Uh, that's a really interesting question, Tony, and I, I think the first thing they've got to ask themselves is, have I got an AD plant which I could either, well, could I build one for a kickoff, 
or have I got one locally? Um, and I think I think Agri is a, is a business with what's going on at Brotherton and the I farms and the innovation that's going on uh, and our development in, in AD. They can come to us, they can, they can ask anyone within Agri, we can point them in the right direction of where there's an AD plant, the potential, the possibilities. So that I would say the first place to call would be, would be Agri and we'll go from there. Great. Uh, John, I'm going to come to you as well, Philip, for the, for the last word on this, this particular question. But, John, what would you add to Matt's comments? Yeah, it's, it's been aware of what's around you. Obviously, there's a limitation on how far forage needs to travel. It's quite a different market to the grain market, but it's one that's sustainable and not, not as commoditised as grain. So it could be secure income, which as part of a farming business is never a bad thing. And Philip, what, what would you, how would you sum up those, those thoughts? Let me rephrase that question to you as a grower. Could you tell us what yield of wheat you'll be achieving next year and what price it will be? And they say, no, but we can tell you what our income will be in the next 20 years. Not next year, but the next 20. What a, what a valuable insight that is, Philip, from, from all of your experience. So bringing this podcast together, here's the question. What would be your top tip to people that have visited today, to listeners to this podcast, that you would urge them to take away in terms of thinking about, considering or being involved in biogas? Um, let's, start, let's start with you, John. You're smiling away there. So what, <laughs> what are you thinking? Um, the technology is advancing. The work Philip has done with varieties shows a significant difference in preferable varieties. So it's using agri work to get the best out of out of it, which is the same across wheat, barley, oilseed, rape, and everything. That's what the company leads towards: is better production. Matt, what would you add? I, I think, from my point of view, Tony, I, I think farmers. Just, just need to have a, the right attitude and don't think that they can't do it. We, we've got, if they have questions, I think we have the answers. And I think, I think a change in mindset, positive attitude towards it, um, and I, I think they can all achieve what they want to do because all the questions can be answered out there. Great. And, and Philip, let's leave the final word to you for this podcast. What would you urge, and that's my question, what would you urge the listeners today to maybe do differently or what can they do to get involved in this really exciting uh, area of farming? Well, uh, my first um, always reaction, and I get several phone calls of that very, very que same question. And I will say, come over to Brother, have one hour with me, and I'll go through it with you from head to tail. And often these visits, when that occurs, is not one hour. It's often three or four hours. But at the end of the day, they've got the picture of what they have to do next, like put them in, if they're interested in putting an AD plant, plans, developers, planning permission, investors, if it's a big one, because there are investors out there, again, short term. And if they're interested in buying an AD plant, I can put them in touch with six or eight AD plants that I know are up for sale. Not because they pass the best, it's simply because the investors have to sell. And in a nutshell, how would you describe this opportunity with generating biogas on farms? I think the opportunity there is open to everybody, um, really, and as I say to people, is accept, adopt and adapt. Well, thank you, Philip, Matt and John, for such a fascinating insight into the trials results and learnings from the Agri-Trial site at Brotherton, providing invaluable information for growing crops for biogas production. That's it for this podcast, but do tune in again as we meet the experts throughout the season, exploring the many immediate and longer-term questions for growers and farmers in the UK. If you have any questions you'd like us to ask the experts, email info at agri.co.uk. See you next time.